You know, I've never been good at keeping my mouth shut. And, and people say to a fault. And I could probably get in a room full of a bunch of ministers and say, Greg, that's just something you keep to yourself, buddy. Right? You don't share with people. I'm not trying to have that kind of a life. I, I don't want to have a bunch of followers. I want to have a bunch of friends. I want to have a bunch of people that, that I can be real with and that they can be real with me. And that nobody has to feel shame for just being real. Nobody has to put on this facade and pretend like um, that sometimes they don't feel naked. That they don't feel naked. Right? And they don't feel like um, there's something wrong with them. And we can't share with each other. That's not the, the kind of life that, <laughs> that I want to have. And so, look, I got a big mouth. And I share the stuff I go through because it helps people see sometimes what, 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 what I go through. It helps them through what they're going through. And sometimes it isn't some complicated theology that means anything to anybody. Sometimes it's just sharing your heart and saying, listen, this is what I'm going through. And people can relate to what you're going through. And they can say, you know what, I'm going through something like that too. And you know, by get, me getting up here and saying that, somebody else could think there's nothing wrong with me because I felt that way. There's nothing wrong with me because I felt like there was something wrong. There's nothing wrong with me because there's times that I haven't been able to do it good or do it right. I can feel peace now. I'm not trying to live up to some standard. You know? Hallelujah. Um, but one of the things that that I used all the time were, were these verses. And uh, I'm not going to use the screen today. It doesn't mean I'm not going to use the screen again, but I'm just slowly kicking the things out of the way that I use to clothe myself and to make myself feel comfortable um, when I'm up on stage because I'm not going to try to clothe myself anymore, right? If I forget everything that I wanted to say on stage, it's just going to be the way that it is. And if I feel naked, I rejoice in the fact that I'm going to be strengthened with the strength of Christ, or the strength that is of Christ, which means I'm going to be strengthened with the strength that says, because I forgot everything I'm on stage, that doesn't give me a testimony of my life. Because I don't know what to say, that's not a testimony of my life. Because it doesn't sound eloquent, that's not a testimony of my life. And now all of a sudden, when I exhale, I feel peace and happiness and joy. Because I realize that I'm not defined by what I do. You see? And that's what it means to be strengthened with the strength that is of Christ. And um, Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. And we're, we're, we're talking about the way, the way grace works and its relationship between, uh, the relationship between grace and faith. So we can get a better under, understanding of what these things are. Because for so long, I thought faith was that I had to concentrate hard enough to believe something. Or that if I concentrated hard enough to believe for what I needed, then I would get it. Um, that if I needed something, if I would go pray enough, or if I would go sing uh, enough praise and worship, or if whatever I did, that I would um, get what I needed. And that was my concept of faith. And if I ever didn't get anything, it was just that I wasn't believing hard enough. Okay, But that's not what faith is. And I'm sure I'll understand how to explain this better five years from now, but I just talk about what, what I get when I get it. I don't say, well, it's not time for the people to hear it. I just talk about it and let God do, do the rest. But this faith that we're talking about is a persuasion. It is a logic. It is a way of thinking. That's what faith is. And it's really, it's a state of mind, okay, for lack of a better way of explaining it right now. It's not something that you do. Okay? It is a state of mind, what faith is, and it's a way of thinking. So Paul says in, in chapter 5, verse 1, he says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Okay, now... Something interesting, something interesting he says here, and I'm going to end up teaching in a couple weeks about what justified is, but there's a difference between justified and justification of life. Those are not the same things. So when he says, therefore, being justified, he's talking about therefore. Notice he just talked about Abraham and how Abraham was strengthened inside of a way of thinking to be perfect and complete as the father of many nations. So Paul comes in and says, therefore, being justified. Justified means that not that you're acceptable in God's eyes. It doesn't mean he's a, 
approving of you, what it means is that you're experiencing the life of your design. Justified means that you're experiencing peace, love, joy, acceptance, or meekness, long-suffering, patience. And it's not a marker to use to say, I'm acceptable to God. Now in the church, even right now as I'm saying that to, to you guys, we've all heard so long that justified means that we've been um, declared to be approved in God's sight. But that's not justified. Justified is the same thing as experiencing righteousness. And we talk about that we, we have righteousness by faith. Righteousness, guys, is the fruit of the Spirit. And so we experience the fruit of the Spirit. We are justified by faith. Okay? Not by concentrating hard. Not by uh, praying hard. Not by trying to get a miracle. Not by fasting. Not by tithing. But by something called faith. Now that word faith there is a noun, guys. It's a way of thinking that brings forth God's quality of life in us. It is a way of thinking that causes the fruit of the Spirit to manifest in us. It is a platform from where we live our lives from. It is a persuasion that we say, um, I live my life from this persuasion. Um, for example, I'm an American, and I walk in the persuasion or the way of thinking that I am American. Okay? So that's what faith is. And Paul says that the, the fruit of the Spirit, or the, God's quality of life, will be brought forth in you, or you will experience it by faith, by this logic, or by this way of thinking. Okay? So he says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith, into this grace wherein we stand. Okay? So now this faith and grace have an interesting relationship because grace develops the faith. Okay? Grace is the thing that paints the picture of the persuasion or the logic or the way of thinking that will cause us to experience God's quality of life. Okay? So grace comes in. And we're talking about grace manifesting itself in the person of Jesus. So grace has manifested in the person of Jesus in order to develop a logic, a way of thinking from where we live our lives from. And it's a logic or a way of thinking about who we are, who God is, and the dynamics involved in our life and relationship with each other. Okay? So grace develops this way of thinking that we live our lives from, or what we would say is that we walk in. Okay? I'm walking in a particular way of thinking right now. And that way of thinking says that I am the beloved Son of God in whom He is well pleased. I am walking in a particular way of thinking that says God will not suffer me to see corruption. Okay? I am walking in a particular way of thinking that says God will never forsake me. I am walking in a particular way of thinking that says that um, who God is or what God believes about me is on display in the resurrected Christ seated at the right hand of God. Okay? I'm walking in that way of thinking. Now, grace develops this way of thinking that I'm walking in. Okay? We talked about how grace put a, a name on our face. It paints a picture of who we really are. And then it paints a picture of who God really is. And then it paints a picture of our relationship to each other. Now, that is called the faith. That is the faith of the Son of God, okay? Now, we're saved from the wisdom that was born from Satan, and we're saved from the, the quality of life that is born from Satan's wisdom when we adopt the faith as our own. When we see the faith that God has developed with grace, when we see this persuasion, this logic, this way of thinking that came to us in Jesus, we're saved when we adopt that way of thinking or that persuasion as our own. Okay? That's what it means to be saved. Okay? Now, guys, faith is a gift. And I'm going to get into this next week. But the Bible says that faith came. Right? Jesus is a perfect representation of what faith is. And what's awesome about Christ is God's whole economy, His whole way of doing everything is contained in Christ. So Jesus is the perfect representation of grace. But guess what? Jesus is also the manifestation of faith. 
He is the revelation of what faith is. And in fact, the scripture in John 1.14 that says, the word became flesh, could just as easily say, faith became flesh. A certain way of thinking, a certain logic, a certain persuasion became flesh in Jesus. Okay? And we beheld Him. And we beheld the glory that was in Him. What that means is a certain way of thinking, a certain persuasion, a certain faith became flesh and we looked upon that persuasion. We looked upon this way of thinking. And this way of thinking was a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our way to lead us into the quality of life that we were created to experience. And so grace um, came in Jesus. He says He was full of grace and truth. Grace came with Jesus. But grace didn't leave when Jesus ascended to the Father. Grace stayed here to develop this persuasion, to develop this way of thinking, to develop this logic in our hearts, to continue to be a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our way, to lead us into this way of thinking, that we might walk in this way of thinking in order that we might experience God's quality of life. In order that we may experience the fruit of the Spirit, guys. Okay, so I could say so many things about being justified. You guys just have to believe it. And, you know, one of the things that mess me all up is I say so many things that are so contrary to what everybody's always heard in the church. I become paralyzed in my brain trying to explain every single thing every single time. And I can never get to say anything because I say I have to explain every single little point. Otherwise, no one's even going to know what I'm saying. And I heard testimonies about that. And that got me under the law. It got me thinking, oh, I'm naked. And I just want you guys to see how this works. I hear no one can understand what I'm saying because there's so, everything I'm saying is so radical. i got to explain so many different things. That was a testimony that told me I was naked. That I was naked as a preacher. And so then I said, well, let me explain everything perfectly all the time so that I can clothe myself and I won't be naked. You see, I was trying to justify myself. I was trying to declare that I am perfect and entire as a preacher. You see, that doesn't make me acceptable to God, but it makes me perfect and entire as a preacher. So perfect and entire, guys, means that you're experiencing the quality of life. And it doesn't mean that you're perfect by design. You are already perfect and complete in your design. God looks upon you and He has declared you are perfectly acceptable to Him. You are His beloved son and daughter in whom He is well pleased. So perfect and entire or justified is to experience God's quality of life, guys. Right? That, that's, what it, that's what it means. So he says, we've been justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Just so you know, I experienced death when I thought I had to clo- close myself, which is the result of Satan's wisdom, right? Um, when I thought I have to explain every single little thing because it's so contrary to what everybody's ever heard, you know what happened was I became paralyzed in my brain and I couldn't explain anything. And it got so bad the last couple of weeks that I couldn't even think about how to try to prepare. Because every time I sat down to try to prepare, my brain would become paralyzed because I would come across one word and i say, well, now I've got to explain what that word means. Now, because it's completely different than what the, whole, the church has always thought. And so I could never say anything. And so guys, I'm just being honest. This week when I was preparing... You know, I got so much stuff inside of me that it, it's, I don't want to say it's killing me. It's not killing me, but I got so much stuff inside of me to say that I feel like I'm going to blow up. Yet when I sat down to try to say it, I couldn't say one word. I couldn't say anything. Because I thought, I've got to explain everything, every, every little word. I can't even get past this one, this one scripture. I can't, I can't even get past this one thing. So listen, guys. I'm comfortable if you don't believe what I say. It's the truth. But I'm not going to spend my life explaining every single word so that you'll be persuaded of it. Okay? I can't do that. I'll get to the explanations when I get to the explanations. And if you want to meet with me privately, then we can get into the explanations. That's one of the reasons why I'm here. So it doesn't mean you don't ask questions. It just means I'm not going to get caught up in the, the, the 45 minutes at church trying to explain every word. So if you don't understand justified and you want to meet with me, I am your pastor. You can call me and I will come and sit with you and we could talk all day about justified. Okay? So I'm here for that. So he says, by whom also we have access into this grace by faith. Now he says we're already standing in this grace. 
Everybody in the world is standing in the grace, guys. Even the people who haven't believed yet. That's what, it's, that's what it means when, it said, when Jesus said in Luke that He came to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Which means God has declared nobody is in debt anymore. Everybody is acceptable to Him. Come home. That's the acceptable year of the Lord. He has declared all of mankind to be His beloved daughters and sons in whom He is well pleased. Right? And He says to you, your debt, your, 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 the debt that you incurred from sin has been paid. Come home to your inheritance. I am your inheritance. His life is our inheritance. Okay? So He says we have access by faith into the grace that we're already standing in. So grace develops the faith. It develops this picture of faith, right? This way of thinking that we walk in, right? So grace has come in the face of Jesus Christ. And he has developed a way of thinking or a persuasion or a logic in my heart. And now this logic, this way of thinking in my heart that I'm walking in, it has given me access into the grace wherein I stand already. Okay? And that access is giving me or causing me to experience the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, contentment, long-suffering, patience. You know, one of the greatest fruits of the Spirit is patience. You know why? Because you get saved or you get born again, especially with the American gospel, and then we have a timeline about when we should be seeing the fruit. And if we do not see the fruit quick enough, if the people aren't giving enough quick enough, if they're not doing enough quick enough, if they're not um, doing whatever we've determined they should do, then we say that they must not be saved. Now, guys, one of, and I'm going to, next week I'm probably going to explain the fruit of the Spirit in connection to Christ seated at the right hand of God and show how each one of those fruits connects to finding the testimony of your life in the resurrected Christ seated at the right hand of God, okay? But patience is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Now, that's, that does not mean that when I'm in my car and somebody has cut me off that I have patience with them. You see, we think carnally, and so we think that's what patience means. Okay, But the fruit of the Spirit is not about us um, <laughs> having peace while we drive the car. Although we will have peace while we drive the car. Okay, But that's not what it's about. It's about saving us and keeping us safe from the wisdom of Satan and the life that is born from Satan. So patience as a fruit of the Spirit may, at work in a person's heart, if I'm ministering patience to somebody and they come to me and say, but Greg, I don't see the fruit of the Spirit in my life yet. I'm just not loving people the way that I want to love people enough. I'm just not um, giving at church the way that I want to. I feel bad. I'm not doing enough. I should be doing more. I don't have enough. I should be doing something to get what I think I don't have. God must be upset with me. See, patience would come in and say, you are as you ought to be. Patience would come in and say, the testimony of your life is not found in those things. It is found in the resurrected Christ. And so patience works to keep you from adopting the wisdom of Satan, which says, because I don't see enough of this fruit in my life, let me now get busy to bring it forth myself so I can prove that I'm okay. That's patience, man. And so when I first got up on stage, guys, I wasn't walking in the patience. Because I got up on stage and I went blank. And I thought, this is not good. How can I get by having gone blank? And so I got busy trying to clothe myself because I didn't have the patience to say, God will make me as I ought to be. He will present me as the preacher. I will not present myself. You see? And because I didn't have patience working in my heart right there, because I was tempted to think that I wasn't as I ought to be as a preacher, I was tempted to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which said I can make myself a good preacher through my preparation and through all my notes. You see, so I adopted Satan's wisdom. I was deceived into adopting Satan's wisdom because it seems noble to think, let me preach real good. Because, you know, the only reason why I want to preach real good is so the people can be free. It isn't some selfish thing. Those of you that have been here know I ain't trying to get some money. 
I ain't trying to big myself, build myself some, some real empire. So it, it was real easy for me to be tempted, guys, because I had a noble desire. I desired for the people to experience the life of God. I desired for the people to be free. Now, I was presented with a way of thinking that said, well, buddy, you, you forget everything when you get on stage. How is anybody going to get set free? But if you do this, then your preaching can be good and people can be set free. You see, and because my desire was noble, I, I took it, I ate it. And you see, what happened was, is that that worked death in me. And week by week, what was happening was, I would have to prepare more and more and more. I would have to study more and more and more. And then what happened was, I couldn't prepare. And I couldn't think straight. And it just got worse and worse and worse. You see, because that was not God's quality of life. That is not His desire for me. And you see, you see how this wisdom does this. Now, the... The awesome thing is, is that I, Grace had painted a, a good enough picture of this persuasion or this way of thinking or this logic in my heart about the life I was created for and about the Father justifying me, about the Father clothing me, about the Father di- putting me on the d- display as full of glory and honor. There was enough of that persuasion working in my life that I experienced peace and joy in the midst of feeling bad. And it was a crazy thing for me, guys, because it used to be when things weren't going good, I would be, feel separated from God. And I would feel like I, wasn't, I must be doing something wrong. God has run for the hills. But in the midst of this happening to me, you know, I felt more love and comfort from God than I ever had felt in my whole life, even though there was a part of my emotions that was scared, that was scared to stand there naked. You know, guys, Jesus had emotion before he went to the cross that told him, you don't want to do that, buddy. He experienced that too. And so what happens is, is the faith or the way of thinking or the logic Jesus had working in his heart, what it did was it strengthened him in his inner man to feel peace and comfort and joy in the midst of going to the cross. Even though he found something telling him, you're going to be naked in front of everybody, man. What are they going to think of you? What does this mean about you that you're naked? You see, Jesus had a way of thinking that said, um, The cross can never be a testimony about my life. The cross can never be a word about how valuable I am to God. The cross can never give a testimony about how perfect and complete I am. See, he had a way of thinking that said that in his heart. And so what it did was it activated patience. And so he was patient. And he allowed God to justify him as the Son of God and not himself right and we all know God justified him as the son of God didn't he he raised him up justifying him as the son of God right so guys this is the persuasion that the faith that grace develops the persuasion and then I walk in something called the faith of the son of God I don't concentrate real hard it's the faith of the son of God I walk in it and guys the only way this faith can be developed is By hearing what God has declared about you in Christ. By beholding Christ and saying who he is is who I am. Which means what God believes about him is what God believes about me. And then I see the dynamics of the relationship and the life that that father and son have. And I see that that's the dynamics of the life and the fellowship that I have with God. Okay? And so it develops this way of thinking. You can't develop that way of thinking by getting in your closet and just praying. You have to hear the word, guys. So for so long, growing up in church, I, I was taught that I just don't believe enough. And if I go pray for a certain amount of hours, then I could believe enough. But guys, if I never hear the word that develops the faith or the way of thinking that will fill me full of the power of God, then how can I experience that? I can't. <laughs> Doesn't matter what I do. I'm going through aimless calisthenics in order to do this. So... Grace has manifested in the person of Jesus uh, to do a work to deliver us from the bondage of sin and death. It's, um, it's manifested in, in the person of Jesus to do a work to declare mankind free of guilt and acceptable to God. Okay, And it's, it, it does a work to lead us into the, the, the quality of life. It, it does a work to um, seed us in a place where we, can, where we have a, a foundation where we can find and experience life from. 
Okay, so that's what grace does. It, it performs a work, and it's come in the, 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 the face of Jesus to do this work, and the work that he does develops a way of thinking, a faith, a persuasion. This is shocking to people, but, and it, it's just a way of saying this, but your faith doesn't save you because you're not the one who created the faith, right? God gave you a faith that will save you. And that's why it says that every man was given the measure of faith. Every man was presented with the measure of faith. What saves me is if when I see this faith God has presented me with, I agree with it. I adopt it as my own. And that saves me. But I didn't create this faith. So it's not my faith. God believed something to be true about mankind and the dynamics of their relationship with Him. Now, he presented that to me, and when I adopt it as my own faith, I'm saved. Okay? So we get all caught up and say, well, faith, you know, when, you, when preachers say faith is a gift, people get all upset. Faith is a gift, and I'll probably get into that next week and start talking about what this is. So the, the way that, that grace um, causes us to, to experience uh, life is that it establishes an incorruptible testimony about who we are. Okay, You experience life from a way of thinking that says the testimony of who I am is incorruptible. Okay, That's the only way you can experience God's quality of life, is if you have a way of thinking in your heart that says nothing can corrupt the testimony of who I am to God and how valuable I am. Nothing can corrupt that testimony. Okay, So God, grace... Um, it, it establishes an incorruptible testimony of us, and it develops the foundation from where we can now find and experience life, which we were created to experience life from a certain place. And that's the only place we can experience this life from. Okay? Now, we, we, we want to preach this word so people can see what God has done in grace or through grace in Jesus to cause us to experience His quality of life. So, Everybody can hear how you experience the fruit of the Spirit and give up their own efforts to do it themselves, okay? Because what we have going on widespread in the world and in the church is mankind trying to use the law to establish their own testimony, to establish a testimony about their life that, um, that they say will be incorruptible enough that they feel peace, joy, contentment, uh, love in their heart. And we don't just see it at work with the law, guys. We see it at work with the flesh. One of the greatest transitions for me in my understanding of grace is when I realized the law isn't evil. The law just showed me that I believed in something that was evil. Okay? So the law is not evil, but the law was never given to give you life. So you cannot use it to get life. Okay? So one of the greatest things I understood is that the law just revealed the way and the workings of the flesh or the wisdom that was born from Satan. So we don't just use the, the commandments to try to establish this incorruptible testimony. What we do is we try to gather possessions and titles and accolades in the earth to develop an incorruptible testimony of our lives. We'll say, um, if I get this amount of money, then that will develop a testimony that I am the blessed of God. If I get this amount of possessions, that will develop a testimony that says I am acceptable to God. And we say, I will find life from that testimony, okay? One of the greatest things you can get in your heart to understand about how you experience life is to realize life comes from the testimony of who you are to God and the way in which He will always express Himself towards you and the way in which He will always manifest Himself in your life. God will not suffer me to suffer corruption, guys. You see? And that testimony... What it does is it causes me to experience eternal life because it is an incorruptible testimony. So when I couldn't preach up here last week, I experienced life even though I couldn't preach. Or I, in my mind, my legalistic mind, I couldn't preach good enough. Okay, I still preach. Um, <laughs> in my mind, I experienced life because I realized God would not suffer me to see corruption. And I felt peace. Right? It brought peace into my heart. So, Romans chapter 4, verse 25. Romans chapter 4, verse 25. Romans chapter 4, verse 25. 
I kind of like walking around with the Bible. I guess I'm funny like that. You know, I developed a law that said I, I can do this if I have the verses up on the screen before I started doing this. Because I knew, you know, looking back at high school, I, I wouldn't stand up in front of class and give the reports. I would take a zero. That's how bad I didn't want to stand in front of people. And so I thought, Lord, how can I do this? And I, I, I made a crutch, right? I made a law that said, well, if I have those verses, then I can do it. <laughs> you guys see how it works? And so I was clothing myself. God is faithful. You can see so many things just for me talking about this story. You know, God, you see the faithfulness of God because even in the midst of be, me being afraid to stand here naked, He still came and spoke through me. You see, He didn't say, well, you're not doing it right, Greg, so I can't come and bless you. You're not believing perfectly right, so I can't bless you, Greg. He didn't say that. You see, He saw my heart, and He came and He blessed me anyway. He blessed me anyway, guys. So do not have this... This, there, there, there's this concept that, that, that mixes the, the message of grace in with the word of faith that says um, right believing uh, gives you everything you need in life. And we've twisted it into, well, if I believe right, then I'll have all the money I need, then I'll have all the cars I need, then I'll have everything that I need. That's not what right believing means. Right believing means that if I believe that it's the faithfulness of God and not my own faithfulness that produces his quality of life in me, then I will experience the fruit of the Spirit in every situation of my life. That's what right believing produces, okay? The blessing of God cannot be trivialized into some carnal blessing, okay? And we look back at Abraham, and we say, well, Abraham had all these worldly possessions. The Old Testament is a type and a shadow, guys, okay? Abraham, that's a picture of Abraham being exceedingly fruitful, okay? By believing in the grace of God. Now, if you transfer that to the New Testament, us being exceedingly fruitful means that I will find so much joy being born in my life that I don't know what to do with myself. I will find so much peace being born in my life that I won't know what to do with myself. I will find so much uh, love being born in my life that I just can't help but go hug and tell everybody how much God loves them, even the people that hate me. That's what it means to be exceedingly fruitful for the New Testament believers, guys. And it doesn't mean things can't go well for you in the world. It just means you're not defined by those things. You don't define the blessing of God in your life with those things. And if you operate from that platform, you are going to be like me. It's only going to be a matter of time before you're experiencing the kind of life called death. Right? If you implement that wisdom, that you define the blessing of God by your clothes, your money, your cars. It, it, you're one step from eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You're one step from saying, well, if I don't have those things, what am I doing wrong? The second you say, what am I doing wrong, you have said, I will clothe myself. And you will get busy trying to get those things. So, um, oh man, the wind blew my stuff all up. Romans chapter 4, verse 25 says, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Okay? Um, now, this is talking about Jesus. He was delivered for our offenses, and he was raised again for our justification. Now, this word justification means the act of God declaring men free from guilt and acceptable to him. To render man as innocent. Okay? Now, God had to do this for all man. Otherwise, there would be nothing for man to believe in. Okay? There would be nothing for man to adopt. There'd be no way of thinking for us to think that we can go running back to our inheritance. We would still feel separated from God. So the part we want to look at here is that God raised Jesus from the dead. He raised him up from the kind of life that was called death, that was a result of the wisdom we had adopted, the, re the result of sin. He raised him up from the dead, okay, demonstrating that he was acceptable to God and that he was innocent of all the accusations that were leveled against him. Okay, And then he seated him at the right hand to demonstrate that he is the son. And he is full of glory and honor. And he is full of significance to me. Okay, Now, Jesus is the representative of who we are. And so when God did this through Jesus, he was demonstrating what he was doing for all of us. Okay, Now, what we see in this picture is the grace of God manifested as his strength to establish an incorruptible testimony about mankind, okay? So when he raised Jesus from the dead and sat him at the right hand, he established an incorruptible testimony about Jesus. 
And in that he established an incorruptible testimony about Jesus, Jesus is the representative of who you are. He established an incorruptible testimony about who you are. And it's through his strength to do that. Okay? Now he did this so that this could become the new testimony about your life. And in that this could become the new testimony about your life, you could experience life. You could experience peace, joy, contentment, long-suffering. Okay? So we see the grace of God at work to establish a testimony about man. Now the power in this testimony, the power that saves us from Satan's life and causes us to experience God's life, is that this testimony God has used His strength to establish can never be corrupted ever again. It can't be corrupted by anything in this world. It cannot be corrupted by some sinful action you commit. It cannot be corrupted by some failure you have in your life. It cannot be corrupted by um, you having a lack of material possessions. It cannot be corrupted by something that has happened to you in this life. Okay? So God's grace and strength has come to establish a testimony about your life that can never be corrupted ever again. Now, the reason he does this is because if the testimony could be corrupted, then you, would get, you could get busy trying to establish your own testimony. And then that would cause you to again experience Satan's kind of life. So the only way you could be free from Satan's wisdom, which is called sin, and the life that comes forth from Satan's wisdom, which is called death, is if there could be an incorruptible testimony established about who you are. Okay? And it isn't just an incorruptible testimony established about who you are, but it's an incorruptible testimony established about who God is in the way he will express himself towards you, which is that he will never suffer you to experience corruption. He will not leave you dead. He will not leave you experiencing death. He will raise you up. For so long, guys, we've thought that the testimony, we've developed a testimony about God that says he's corruptible. I don't know if you guys realize this, but all the while that we're telling people that God's judging them for their sins, do you know we're developing a faith, a persuasion, a way of thinking that gives God a corruptible testimony as God? <laughs> you guys realize that? That's what happens when you preach that God's judging people for their sins. If God is judging people for their sins, how could a person ever have confidence or ever feel like God will raise them up from the dead? They could never feel that way. They would always feel like they had to do enough to establish a good enough testimony that God would raise them from the dead. That's not rest, guys. That's enlisting your own strength and ability to raise yourself up. That's what brings forth Satan's quality of life. So he established this incorruptible testimony. Now, because for so long we've, we've misunderstood what the law is and how it works, we don't understand what these things are. And sometimes I say things in passing that just become second nature to me. And, and, and I see people look at me like, what? But the law, guys, Moses said in Exodus, when God was giving the law, or however you want to talk about it, the angels gave the law, God's voice was speaking. Whenever the law was being given to the children of Israel, they were afraid, and they said, Moses, you go talk to God. We don't want to hear his voice anymore because they were afraid. And Moses said, fear not, for God has come to prove you that your fear may be before him in order that you sin not. Now, what Moses was saying was that God gave the law because the children of Israel had adopted Satan's wisdom in their heart. So he gave the law to prove their heart. That word prove means to burn like the dross off of a silver. Okay, so God gave the law to burn Satan's wisdom out of our heart. Now, he did this by showing us that this wisdom we adopted could only produce death. Now, that's why the law is called the ministration of death. Okay, because it shows us that when we trust in our own ability, it can only bring forth death. Okay, now he says this, I did this so that your fear would be before me. What that means is to fear the Lord means to worship the Lord. Okay? Now you worship the Lord by believing what he believes. Okay? So he proved our hearts from Satan's belief system by giving us the law. And then he showed us what he, so that we would believe unto him instead of our own strength in order that we sin not, which means to miss the mark. Now in that instance it means in order that we don't fail to experience the quality of life he created us to experience. So we were believing something that could only produce a kind of life called death. 
Now, he gave us the law to show us we were believing something that would kill us in order that we would now believe unto him instead of our own strength so that we could experience the quality of life called eternal life, which is defined by the fruit of the Spirit. Okay? So, guys, the law would be the representation. If I'm, if I'm connecting myself to the law, what I'm saying is God has established a testimony of who I am in Christ, and that's where I would find life by seeing who he is as who I am. Now, the law would represent man's strength to establish his own testimony. So if you're in a relationship with God where you're trying to perform carnal commandments and principles, if you're in a relationship with God where you're trying to do everything right so that you can feel life, what you're doing is you're trying to establish a testimony about who you are as the son and daughter of God through your own strength. That's what you're trying to do. So what we have in the gospel is a laying forth in front of us um, what he said in Deuteronomy. I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, choose life. The law being given represented death and cursing. If I try to experience life by establishing a testimony about myself through my ability to perform carnal commandments and principles, you know I'll never experience life because I'll never be able to do it. I'll always fail. There'll always be some principle I won't follow. There'll always be some sin that will happen in my life, right? You know what happens when you try to find life in establishing your own testimony is that you're going to fail sometimes. Now, what will that give you as a testimony about your life when you fail? Will you feel peace? Will you feel peace? Can you ever feel peace if you use the law to try to establish the testimony of your life? You can never feel peace, guys, because you'll always miss it in some area, and that will torment you. And you'll be fearful that God won't raise you up. You'll be fearful that you won't be glorified, right? The Bible says that our hope of glory, Paul said, we rejoice in the hope of glory. In this faith, by this faith, we rejoice in the hope of glory. My hope for glory, guys, is not in my ability to do everything right. It's not in my ability to even see the fruit of the Spirit manifesting in my life. My hope of glory is found in the representative of who I am seated at the right hand of God. And because I believe that who He is is who I am, I find the vital principle born in my heart that says He is Son. That means I am Son. And I see that God raised Him up from the dead, and that tells me that my hope for glory is that God will also raise me up. And the reason why I can have peace and the reason why I can find joy in this world is because I see that God is going to raise me up. And there's nothing that can ever corrupt the testimony of my life. There's nothing that can stop this from happening. And so this is how you experience life, guys. He develops a testimony about who you are in Christ. And he speaks it to you so that you can see and hear it. And it develops a persuasion or a logic or a way of thinking that you have about yourself. So that when you miss it and you commit some sinful action, you feel patience born in your heart. And you say, I don't have to get busy trying to take care of this sinful action. I will see what God says about me in Christ and I will trust that He will take care of this. Right? And that's what the Gospel does, guys. That's how this... This thing manifests in your life. So he, 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 he establishes a testimony about who you are so you can walk in this new testimony, which means you walk in a way of thinking. Like I said earlier, I'm walking in American right now, right? As I'm walking right here right now, I'm walking in American. Now, am I doing anything to be walking in American? No, I'm just being, right? Right? Well, that's what happens with the testimony God establishes about you. You walk in a particular way of thinking. You walk in a particular logic or faith um, that's called walking in the Spirit. So when God raised Jesus up from the dead, it says he was raised a life-giving spirit. Okay? It doesn't mean that he doesn't have a body anymore. What God is doing is he's developing a difference between a testimony found in the flesh, which is corruptible, and a testimony found in the Spirit, which is incorruptible. So Jesus was raised a life-giving spirit, which means he was raised an incorruptible testimony of man. And this spirit, or this, 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 the definition that he gives it, is that he's a spirit. And all he's talking about is that this testimony is incorruptible. 
So walking in the Spirit means that I walk in the testimony God established about who I am in Christ. Which means there's nothing that can corrupt this testimony. There is no sinful action I can commit. There is no um, failure I can experience in this world. There's no traumatic event that can happen to me in this earth that could ever corrupt the testimony of my life. And so when these things happen to me, I see that it can't define me and I'm walking in the Spirit. So th this is what it means that um, to be born of an incorruptible seed. You know, it says that we're born again of an incorruptible seed. It means that we're born from a testimony that can never be corrupted again. And if I believe or if I operate from the persuasion that nothing that happens to me or nothing that I do right or wrong can corrupt my testimony, then I never enlist my own ability in order to establish my own testimony. Okay, And then I experience life from that foundation. This is the only foundation that you can experience life from. And this is a hard thing for, um, for people to, to accept. And it actually causes people to be offended. And this is the offense of the cross. And it's also the offense that causes a lot of people to stumble. Because when you start telling them that who Christ is is who they are, they start, the religious mind gets real offended by that. It gets real upset. They start saying, well, how can I be who Jesus is? How can, that be, how can the same glory that Jesus has be the glory that I have? And then they miss the whole part of the gospel. But John 6, 62, John chapter 6, verse 62, Jesus talks about this. And John chapter 6, verse 62 and 63. And this is right after he talked about, um, this is right after he told them if they eat his flesh and drink his blood, it shall be life to them. And this was a hard saying for them to hear because they were looking at it carnally. They were saying, how can we drink your blood and eat your flesh? They were kind of grossed out, right? I mean, that sounds like cannibalism, right? But Jesus was not speaking carnal words to them. He was speaking spirit words to them. And so he's saying, unless you partake of what it means that my body was broken on the cross so that you could be divorced from Satan's wisdom called sin, unless you drink from the cup of my blood, which ratifies this new covenant, which says you find life by believing on the word I've declared in Jesus and not in your own strength and ability, then you will not find life. But look what he says right after he says that. I'll start, I'll start at verse 61. He says, When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? Does this cause you to stumble? Does this cause you to want to reject my words? Okay? Now look what he says. What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before. Then he says, it is the spirit that quickens, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, um, unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So they became offended by him saying they would, he would, they would have to eat his body and drink his blood. He says, listen guys, if this causes you to stumble, what's going to happen when the Son of Man ascends up to where he was before? Now notice he calls himself the Son of Man for a reason. He calls himself the Son of Man because they're all the Son of Men also. And he wants them to connect when he ascends up to heaven to the right hand of God. He wants them to connect themselves to that very action. He wants them to see themselves ascending to the right hand of God and being seated with God. He says, if you're becoming offended by what I just said, what will you think when the Son of Man ascends to the right hand of God? And this, notice what he says. He says, it is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. Now he's talking about this testimony, guys. When he ascended to the right hand of God, he established a testimony of man in the spirit. And a testimony in the spirit is incorruptible, right? The flesh profits nothing. He said, he said the spirit is what gives life. When he says, um, it is the spirit that quickens. He says it's the spirit that will give you life. This is what he's talking about. The testimony that, of your life that is found in the spirit which is Jesus, is the thing that will give you life. He says the testimony that you can establish in the flesh will profit you nothing. Okay? And that's what we have going on. We've been trying to experience life by establishing a good enough testimony by what we do for God. And that can profit us nothing. It can never give us life. Guys? So when, Jesus, when it says that Jesus is, is raised a life-giving spirit, 
He's giving us a picture of what it means to walk in the Spirit. Okay? Walking in the Spirit, guys, is not talking about God told me what to do and I do it. That's not walking in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit is not performing some action. Okay? That's not what walking in the Spirit is. And what's happened is, is we've defined walking in the Spirit actually in a way that would be consistent with the definition of walking in the flesh. Because walking in the flesh is talking about what you do and what you can get and what you can have by what you do. So walking in the Spirit, guys, is not God tells you what to do and you go do it. It's not God barking orders at you and then you go do it. That's called servitude. That's called the life of a slave, guys. That's not being, okay? Walking in the Spirit means that you're walking in a logic, a way of thinking, a persuasion that says who I am or the testimony of my life is found in the Spirit. Jesus is the representation of the testimony that's been established in the Spirit. So walking in the Spirit means I walk in the vital principle that who Christ is, is who I am. And the way, God will, the way God has related to Jesus is the only way He will relate to me. And the, the fellowship and the life and the dynamics that they share between themselves is the fellowship or the dynamics of the fellowship and life that I share with God. That's what walking in the Spirit is, guys. I walk in a persuasion that says, there's nothing in this world that can define my glory. There's nothing in this world that I could do that could give me a testimony of my life. There's no sinful action I could commit that can give me a negative testimony of my life. There's no sinful action I could commit that would give a negative testimony about how God will relate to me. There is no sinful action that I could commit that can define the blessing of God in my life. That's a practical way of looking at what it means to walk in the Spirit. For you're walking in the testimony that was established in the Spirit, which means that it's incorruptible. Right? That testimony that's been established is incorruptible. To walk in the Spirit means that you walk in an incorruptible testimony. That's what it means to walk in the Spirit, guys. Now, there is a certain kind of life that is born from walking in the Spirit. Okay? And that kind of life is not defined by God told me to start some church, so I started the church. That kind of life is defined by peace, joy, love, contentment, long-suffering, meekness. Guys, long-suffering doesn't mean that I will suffer for a long time. <laughs> you say that all the time, boy, and you see Christian's heads just, eh, eh. It, it's almost like, oh, I can't hear that, I can't hear that. Do you know what's funny is that's actually... Your design telling you that I have not been made to suffer. <laughs> you reject the concept that long suffering means that I will suffer a long time. Long suffering means that you don't grow impatient waiting for your hope of gl your glory being revealed in Christ's return. That's what long suffering means. It means that, just like patience, it means that you don't uh, grow weary waiting for Jesus to come back and reveal your glory for all the world to see. Okay, It means you continue to trust and find the testimony of your glory in Christ even though the world may not see it right now. That's what long-suffering is. Long-suffering says the world says about my life, I don't see any glory in your life. Well, long-suffering says, well, I'm not going to get busy trying to prove I have glory. Okay, I'm going to uh, be patient and wait for the hope of glory, which is Christ's return. Well, when He returns, it says I will see Him and I will see that I am the same as He is. Now, it doesn't mean I'll have long hair and a hippie robe, like the picture we have of Jesus. It, what it means is I will see that I have a glorified body in the same manner of His glorified body. And you know what keeps most of us from thinking that we're glorious? Is we look at our body and we think that our body don't look so glorious. We define ourselves by the flesh. We see the sins we commit. We see all of our failures. We see the things that we wanted to do that we didn't succeed at. And we say, there's no glory in me. That's walking in the flesh, guys. When you define your significance, when you define your glory, when you define the blessing of God in your life by what you see that you have, by your successes, or the amount of sin you see in your life. That's what it means to walk in the flesh. If you define how God will behave to you based on the sinful action in your life, you're walking in the flesh. If you define your glory 
by what you have, you're walking after the flesh. If you define your glory and significance or the blessing of God in your life by your success in this world, you're walking after the flesh, guys. And so it's a state of mind. It's a persuasion. And this is what, when, when you look at this, you see it perfectly. Satan got Adam to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that established a corruptible testimony of man. And then man walked in a persuasion or a way of thinking or a logic that said the testimony of who I am is found in the flesh. Now that is called walking in the flesh, okay? Now God comes through his grace, his strength, he establishes a testimony about who our life that is called an identity that is found in the spirit. And now if I adopt that persuasion, that way of thinking, I'm walking in the spirit, okay? We spend too much time looking at the fruit of the Spirit as an action. It is something that we experience, okay? So this is a perfect example of grace and believing under the strength of man. You can believe under the grace of God, okay, to raise you up and bring forth God's quality of life by the testimony he's established about you, or you can believe in the strength of man by uh, performing carnal commandments, by working to do to get to have in order to establish your own testimony to have life. Those are the two things you can believe in. One is called walking after the flesh, and one is called walking after the Spirit. Okay? Now, when we become confused, like when I was confused, when I ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and thought I had to clothe myself up on stage, there was a record or evidence of the incorruptible testimony of my life seated at the right hand of God. And so what I did was I fellowshiped with the Son. I fellowshiped with the Son by reminding myself that the testimony of my life was not found in my ability to preach. It was found in Christ. You see? And that fellowship saved me. And my fellowship was with the Son. And then I saw that my relationship and the, the fellowship I had with God was defined by the dynamics of the life and fellowship that Jesus had with God. And then I said, well, Jesus didn't clothe himself. God clothed him. And so then I, I found my life being born from this way of thinking that said I don't have to clothe myself by preparing hard or by studying hard. For it is God who will clothe me because the dynamics of our life and our fellowship that we share is that he's the one who clothes me. You see, and I was walking in the Spirit. You see, that's what walking in the Spirit was, guys. It wasn't that I went and did something. It said I was walking in a way of thinking that says God is the one who will clothe me. That's walking in the Spirit. So Ephesians 1.4. People do this all the time and they don't realize it. And I, I'm talking a lot about this because, you know, I had gotten off and, and just wanting the people who would believe grace to experience life. But then I realized there's a whole lot of people still believing under the flesh. And I thought, let me, let me explain how you experience life so we can see the difference of trying to find life in yourself and trying to find life in, in the grace of God. You have the strength of man and you have the strength of God. Jesus is the strength of God to do this, manifest it, okay? The law is the strength of man. Uh, is, it, the law reveals the strength of man to do what God did in Jesus, okay? So, when we get to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, and I'll start with verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, guys, these verses are telling us the place that God created mankind to sit and occupy. This is the place that God predetermined that man would sit and occupy. The place that we see Christ sitting in and occupying at the right hand of God. He revealed in Christ, listen guys, this is the place I've always created you to function from. This is the platform I've always created you to find and experience life from. Seeing that where Christ is, is where you are. Seeing that who Christ is, is who you are. Seeing that the way that I have manifested myself in Christ's life is the way that I will manifest myself in your life. This is the place he's created us to live from for all eternity. And he did this before the beginning of the world. He always saw us this way. Now look what he says about this. He says, according as he hath chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world, 
that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Notice that he says that in this position, that we're holy and without blame. We're holy and without blame. The only way that you can experience life is to find life from the foundation that I am holy and without blame before God. Period. That's the only place you can experience life from. He says that he created us from the foundation of the world in Christ, that we would be holy and without blame before him in love. Because that's the only way that we can have confidence in the integrity of God's actions towards us, is if we're holy and without blame. We'll never trust in the integrity of the way he will behave towards us if we feel like um, the testimony of who we are is corruptible by some sin. We'll never trust in the integrity of his emotions for us, guys, if we don't stand before him innocent. And this is the work that he did when he justified our lives or when he uh, raised us up for for justification. I don't want to mix these terms up. Um, When he declared us acceptable to him, and innocent. The reason he did this is because the only platform you can ever experience God's quality of life is from the platform of your total and complete innocence all the time. Because if you feel like you have blame in front of him, you will not trust in his integrity to glorify you. And you will think that you need to get busy glorifying yourself. Listen, if you, if, if you think that, that you have spot. If you think that you're full of blame in God's presence, um, which is what you'll feel like if you find the testimony of your life in in the flesh by performing carnal commandments or principles or what you have or what you can get or what you do, um, you're going to feel like there's something to be blamed for. (laughs) And so, guys, this is what grace comes in the person of Jesus to do. He does a work to seat all of man in a place where they could never be accused again, and the testimony of who they are could never be corrupted ever again, okay? So he does a work to do this. Man tries to do a work to do that by using the law, okay? Now, after he does this work, he influences our heart with the work that he did by the word about what he did in Jesus unto a persuasion or a way of thinking that our testimony is incorruptible and so that we would walk in the Spirit Because the incorruptible testimony is an identity that is a spirit identity. And so when I'm walking in the spirit, I'm walking in an incorruptible testimony. And that brings forth peace, joy, love, contentment, long-suffering, patience, meekness, meekness. You know, meekness. You have meekness when you're not worried about glorifying yourself, right? You're not busy trying to establish your own testimony. You have meekness. You can let a bunch of guys step all over you and not care about it. Because you say, wait a second, I'm, I'm not establishing my own testimony. The greatest testimony that could ever be established about who I am has already happened. And now I rejoice in the hope of that glory that I see in Christ being revealed in me in the day that he returns. I rejoice in the hope of that glory being revealed in me. Not the glory I will get, the glory that I already have, but that will be revealed for the whole world to see. You know, this is why Satan was angry with man. Because he knew the glory God ascribed to man. And he said, I want that glory. Now, I just want to look at at Satan's wisdom real quick so we can connect this to the law, and then I'll just finish up there. Isaiah chapter 14, I think. Isaiah chapter 14. I find one of the things that confuse Christians the most is they don't understand the origin of sin. And it's because they don't understand where sin came from or what sin is, they don't know what they've been saved from, and they continue walking in sin. And when I say sin, I don't mean some sinful action. I mean a way of thinking, okay? And so we want to look at the origin of sin and see what sin actually is, okay? Um, Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13, I believe, says, this is talking about Satan. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Now this is Satan talking, guys. Look what he says. I will, um, he says in his heart, I will ascend into heaven. When you adopt a wisdom in your heart that says, 
I will establish a good report about who I am through the law of Moses by performing carnal commandments and principles. You're saying I will ascend into heaven through my own strength. I will exalt myself to the throne through my own strength and ability. That's the same thing Satan said, guys. Satan said, I reject the position God has given me as a free gift and the glory he has given me. I will use my own ability, my own strength to ascend into heaven. When you adopt the wisdom that's the law and the commandments, guys, you're trying to ascend into heaven and seat yourself in the position that God created you to sit just because of who you are. (laughs) You know, you didn't do anything to sit at the throne. You don't have to do something to prove that this is the position you're supposed to be in. You don't do something to prove you have glory and honor. You have glory and honor because you come from the Most High God who has glory and honor. It's like I have blue eyes because my parents have blue eyes. I didn't do something to get the blue eyes. You don't do something to ascend into heaven and sit at the right hand of God. You don't do something to do that. You already are sat there. And now you hear a word that says you're sat there and you adopt that word and you walk in a way of thinking that says I've already ascended into heaven in Jesus. And now I rejoice waiting for the hope of this glory being revealed. And so you don't enlist your own ability, guys. Do you guys see the wisdom of Satan at work in the church connecting themselves to to relating to God through the law and the commandments? We say that you're not blessed, but if you do these laws and commandments, you can be blessed. We say that um, you haven't had a breakthrough, but if you fast for 21 days in January, you can get a breakthrough. Um, it, you don't have financial prosperity. If you give enough at church, then you can have financial prosperity. Guys, that's representing man trying to ascend to the throne, the right hand of God, through their own strength. That is born from Satan. You can never find life in that thing. That thing will kill you. So guys, if the reason why we preach about Christ all the time and find in our testimony in Christ is because that's the place where you find life. You find life from an incorruptible testimony about who you are. And it makes you happy when you see how glorious you are. It makes you happy when you see how acceptable you are to God. When you see how happy He is with you. When you see... Um, the beautiful place he created you to experience life with him from. It makes you happy. And then you experience life. And it, it, nothing can steal that life from you because it's not based in the flesh. It's not based on what you do, what you get, what you have, what happens to you. And so you're always experiencing life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for the integrity of who you are. Thank you, Father, that we don't have to be confused about the way that you will manifest yourselves in our lives anymore. Thank you, Father, for your word in Jesus, that we are your beloved sons and daughters in whom that you are well pleased. Thank you that you've created us to function from a platform, that we have already um, been sat in the highest place of honor that we could ever achieve, and that we weren't sat there because of what we do, that we're not sat there um, by what we can do for you. Thank you, Jesus, that you died away our death and you separated us from the corruptible testimony, that you separated us from the the, the testimony or the, the identity that was found in the flesh so that we could experience life and that we could live our lives from the foundation, that there was nothing in this world that could ever corrupt the testimony of my value, of my significance, of to God ever again. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.